Coming? We'll see who's going to do It is. I think I don't know if it's amplified or just recorded. Yeah, yeah, that's the issue. I assume this is just uh, for recording purposes, so not for amplification. So you can't hear me wave. So thank you all for coming. I'm Kevin Jaffe for the umpty umpt uh, time. I'm still Kevin Jaffe, uh, still uh, the department chair, and I'm still happy to see all you folks, uh, fine folks and alums, showing up for our uh, alumni speaker series. This is the final event, the culmination of the year's worth of alumni uh, speaking events, and it's uh, our startup panel. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to once again introduce uh, Greg Hunt uh, from the law firm of Jenkins, Wilson, Taylor, and Hunt, uh, who has uh, graciously been underwriting uh, the series. Thank you, Kevin. I I'm still Greg Hunt, and uh, I mean, I've been here for all of these except for one, and I've really enjoyed it. Um, I was talking to some of the gaming folks before the, con before the talk, and uh, I used to be a gaming programmer when I was a kid. I, I quit doing it because I didn't think it was cool, but now I realize how dumb that was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Greg. Well, let me introduce uh, the speakers, and, and truly, stunningly, you have, you have organically arranged yourself in the order of my notes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fate. So uh, first on my left here is Eric Carlson. He is a graduate of the department from uh, the 70s. Uh, he's the former CEO of Telecantar, a, uh, at the time was a startup doing software uh, services for location-based uh, solution companies. And previously he worked for big, uh, bigger uh, companies such as IBM and SGI, uh, Silicon Graphics. Uh, where he was the executive vice president of their visual computing uh, business. And next to Eric, we have Phaedra Buonadiris, uh, who is a graduate uh, from the 90s here of UNC, both uh, this side of campus and the south side, uh, from Keenan, Keenan Flagler. Um, Phaedra is currently the global lead for serious games and gamification at IBM, and previously she was the founder and CEO of WomenGamers.com. Uh, one of the largest women's gaming portals on the internet. Uh, and next to Phaedra, we have Mike. Uh, Mike Caps, uh, also from uh, the 90s. Uh, Mike is, <laughs> well, yeah, we, we apparently couldn't find anyone from the 80s. <laughs> Where'd they go? Uh, Mike is the former president of Epic Games, uh, locally here in, in North Carolina, and currently he serves on the board for a variety of companies from the Entertainment Software Sony Association and the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. Uh, Mike uh, has, has an interesting pedigree. Uh, he has a degrees from here, bachelor's and, and, and master's, including uh, creative writing, which he always wrote better than I did, but that wasn't hard. Um, uh, he has a, a master's from MIT and a PhD from the Naval Postgraduate School where he served as a faculty member for a, a short uh, stint. And then finally, from the 2000s, uh, we have Aaron, Aaron Houghton, uh, who is the co-founder of iContact, a successful cloud-based email marketing so solution uh, that was located uh, in Raleigh and Morrisville, which was recently acquired for a tidy nine-figure sum. Uh, Aaron's working on his next startup, Boost Suite, uh, which he claims is his 15th startup. That's, that's a large number. Um, and uh, <laughs> so we don't know what that says. So uh, what I'm gonna, so to record this, we have two mics, because we only have two wireless channels, so you two are gonna share, and you two are gonna share. So what I thought we could do is, is maybe uh, go down the line here, and each, you could each tell us uh, a little bit uh, about your startup venture experience and what startups were for you in your day. Eric, back in the 90s. <laughs> well, I realize I have the longest day, so do I get more time to talk about my experience? <laughs> I've been, so my thing, my startup thing began when I left here, thanks to several people here, I was hired by IBM Research. And within the first year that I was there, the metric for research staff members changed from patents and publications to technology transfer. So what I found that I could do as well, maybe better than others there, was to take ideas that we had and try to get the product divisions to adopt them. So we would try to take ideas from the research division and move them into the product divisions, and that was the first attempt. Um, I did that for about 10 years, and then one of the really good ideas, which is a distributed operating system idea we had to connect peripheral devices 
mostly then word processors with mainframes. We proposed that operating system to IBM for the PC so that it could work really well in conjunction with the ma mainframes and mini computers. And the idea was rejected, which led me to leave the company and start another one that essentially used that operating system and made our own hardware. That company for a while was supplying boroughs and AT&T and digital equipment and everybody. So for a while, it was the fastest growing company in the US. It was called Convergent Technologies. Eventually, we were sold to one of our largest customers, Unisys. Um, after that, I did a turnaround, which is a company that was a, basically a hardware company selling manufacturing hardware systems to manuf for manufacturing companies that changed it from hardware to software, including acquisition of the relational database company Ingress at the time. And uh, after that, we sold that company. After that, I went into Silicon Graphics and I started what became known as the Entertainment Systems Division. And we s sold software and hardware to basically all the big studios, uh, movie production, animation production. And when Silicon Graphics decided it wanted to be Cray, I said that was not for me, so I stopped. And from then I, I worked at a project that I started at the University of uh, Santa Clara University, which was basically helping startup companies that were trying to use technology, all kinds of technology, to solve major problems of the poor. So it could be energy, it could be healthcare, uh, it could be farming. So I, I think we helped at this institute that I helped start over the course of 10 years, 200 and some companies start up. And their customer base, I think, now exceeds over 10 million people. So it's still only a drop in the bucket compared to million, billions of poor people, but still it's something. Anyway, so that's me. Thank you. Back in the 90s, when I was getting my undergrad, there was no such thing as a game design and development degree program. So I decided, decided to study math and comp sci. And um, I played games, and my friends played, and my cousins played. But we'd open up most gaming magazines and look at most gaming websites, and they weren't targeting me. So I uh, decided to start a company. It was my second company focusing on women who play computer and console games. And we started the first scholarship in the US for women to pursue degrees in game design and development. And we did a bunch of consulting to game studios and publishers. Since then, uh, after there was a big shift in the market and Nintendo came out with the Wii and everybody started to talk about the casual gamer, I decided to get my MBA and through uh, a case competition at Keenan Flagler, I ended up stumbling upon a career in serious games. So that's, that's my story. Oh, I have my own, thanks. <laughs> Uh, my first startup was here in 94, uh, tried to do a web startup doing HTML editing, but the web wasn't going to go anywhere, so I left the company and instead decided to do my master's degree. It was actually Kevin Jaffe who convinced me of that. Um, the company eventually, <laughs> company eventually was two of us. The other founder uh, went on to uh, be bought by Thompson Publishing, which is like the biggest, and uh, ended up being vice president there. But that's fine because I have a master's degree uh, from UNC, which led to all my other successes later. I started up a Skunk Works inside of a military base, uh, hiring employees, and that was for a video game project. So I have some very interesting startup experience there where it was kind of culture clash, startup within a, a company. Uh, then and actually built a startup here in 2002, uh, ramped it up to about 20 people and then sold that to uh, Epic Games and became the president as part of that transaction. And then since I retired a few years ago, I'm mostly advising startups, uh, 3D publishing, robotics, a lot of virtual reality. Everybody who's got $100 to scrap together thinks they're going to build a virtual reality billion dollar company right now. Um, so uh, a lot in that and uh, having a lot of fun watching other people do what you do, which is start 15 companies and succeed some and fail some and not have to uh, not sleep. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah, nice. Uh, Aaron Houghton, uh, usually when I introduce myself, I say I'm a, a software web tech entrepreneur, and everyone goes, what the hell is that? Uh, so, but everyone in this room understands that, so that's great. Um, been basically building web apps online and uh, for about, gosh, 18 years now. Um, and I found a niche in kind of really early on, just kind of accidentally through, you can see 15 startups, right? There's, there's a lot of iterative experimentation along the way. Um, you know, what started working for me was selling online in a kind of automated fashion to small businesses. So building simple tools that were typically about kind of process simplification, a little bit of automation. Um, not a lot of real high science in the beginning, especially when we were building kind of small apps. 
um, and, and, and we're essentially just selling them online through uh, internet marketing tools like the Googles and um, Facebook platforms and stuff like that. Um, so we found it relatively easy to get these small businesses into our software platforms online. So um, I was mentioning as we were lining up up here that the last time I was in this room, I was presenting uh, a MVP, as you would call it now, a demo of, of some application we were building in class. And um, at, that, at that time, which I guess it was my junior, senior year, um, one of the web apps that, that I had built um, had about $80,000 annual revenue as monthly um, recurring subscription business. And it was actually, of, of the three I had at the time, the one I was paying the least attention to. I really, it was in the email marketing space, ended up becoming the company that, that Kevin kind of mentioned in my introduction, um, was not the one that was most interesting to me. It had kind of the least interesting technology, I thought. I'd, I'd built it, but it just wasn't, you know, I'd already built it, so it was done. Um, and you know, the commercializing side of it wasn't, at the time, the most interesting piece of it. Um, I met up with, you know, important part of my story is meeting up with a guy who was a freshman economics major who spent a lot of time down in the business school and said, hey, you've built a piece of software, let's take this thing out to market and let's, you know, there's a broader use for this thing and we together worked to commercialize that uh, and that's what became the eye contact company. Um, our first success was really in hiring talent out of our friends and, and family. I tried to hire Leon here like two or three times, didn't I? He would never come work for me. Um, but um, just kind of finding talent among the UNC system and mostly students and occasionally we would show up to professor's office hours and ask for help on you know, marketing. We'd show up down in the econ department and ask them questions about market sizing and we'd show up down at the business school and ask them about venture capital and that sort of thing. So leveraging the, uh, the opportunities we had as students to, to build that. And so, um, yeah, we built that company to um, about 350 full-time people here in North Carolina. We originally actually were in downtown Chapel Hill, so above what is now Buns. It was Jersey Mike's back then, that was our office. And we looked back into, he's not here, because we couldn't afford the real estate on the front of the building. So we looked out the back of the building, which, was, uh, which meant we had live music every Thursday and Friday night, provided to, <laughs> to all of our employees till, till 12 a.m. And um, it was a great place to work. Um, so I'll tell more of the story later if we get into it. Thanks. So actually, what I'd like to do is, is follow up on, on a bunch of themes that you, you raised. And, and let me set the context here for today, uh, many of our undergrads will come to faculty such as myself and they have an idea for a startup and they want to pursue it. And, uh, uh, and they assume that, that the thing, the key to success is that, that one creative technical insight. At the same time, we have uh, students coming mostly to, to Michael but sometimes to me from the business school who have uh, the great idea for the company and they just want to shackle a bunch of CS majors to a desk and, and, and have them bang out the code. So all of you started from the technical background, but I'd be curious to get your perspective on the right mix of the technical versus the business uh, background in, in getting your company going and in particular scaling it and becoming a businessman. So maybe you could start, Aaron. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think that's a great, a great question. Actually, one I've thought about a lot. So if you look at kind of different books that have been written around kind of management theory or even kind of startup skill theory and leadership theory, um, I think Marcus Buckingham was one of them, like first break all the rules. It's kind of these things about like, you know, should you improve your strengths or should you just, you know, or should you improve your weaknesses or should you just focus on your strengths and bring in other people to do the rest of it? And so as, as someone with a, a bit of a technology background, um, you know, I, I've struggled with that for, for a long time. And the success I've had, uh, the companies that have been successful have typically been where I've had other kind of sales and marketing talent or even kind of fundraising talent in the business to complement what I have on, on the kind of the skills I had on the technology side. Um, being a technology co-founder, and I hear, I see that all the time actually, what your specific mention of, you know, business students saying, you know, hey, we've come up with the idea it's, you know, it's written on a sheet of paper, so all we need is just a couple of tech guys to hack it out, right? We just, you know, what's the cheapest we can get this done for, right? So even in software companies and in apps, right, where the technology is the core of what they're building, kind of thinking about it the wrong way. And then there's, there's the flip side of it, which I was in this camp. So before the story of, of the founding of iContact, my freshman year at Carolina in, in Graham dorm on North Campus, I was basically building uh, kind of an early student online marketplace. And I was the tech guy, and I built it, and I launched it. and um, I brought in the guy who lived across the hall from me as my founder, and he was in charge of sales. And so I built the app and got it all the way to the end. And the second he was supposed to go out and do sales, I fired him because at that point he hadn't done anything yet and I'd done all the work. Um, <laughs> that company was not successful. So the balance of the two is, is clearly critical. So what others Do you take Mike? Do you want to scroll down? All right. 
Uh, well, a famous author whose name I've forgotten uh, said that there's no value to that idea for a book. It's having written a book. And uh, very much in the games business, every 12-year-old on the planet has an idea for a sequel to a game I've made, which is great, but the hard part is actually getting 100 people together for three years to build it. Um, so, uh, so then I'm going to say the exact opposite about the sort of web internet business, which is it's rare that the technology is something that's out of the reach of most programmers of what you're building. So then it comes down to a bit more the selling it intelligently, building the team well. Uh, it, it's the soft skills side. It's, it's rare. No offense, I don't know anything about eye contact, but I'm guessing there were probably 100 engineers in Chapel Hill who could have built it, right, who have that technical skill. Yeah. But there probably weren't 100 people who could have put that company together and made it successful and found the right customers, right? And so, uh, boy, howdy is it. Uh, you know, I was lucky to be the guy at this school who was not the best programmer, but was the most happy to run the Students Association, because it turns out that's a better skill in running a software company than being the best programmer. I, I think they, they both said it very, very well. Um, there's dangers to both extremes, whether you put too much emphasis on one side versus the other, and really finding the right balance is key. I don't have a lot to add. The, what I learned, I learned here in reading the Mythical Man Month, which is all the successful companies I know had both a technical leader and a business or administrative leader. And if they couldn't agree, the business administrator won. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we can open up this for, for questions at any time, if folks want to pose a question for the panel. Yes. <laughs> if you're a programmer now, hold up your hand. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, no, but so something I was working on recently and struggling with is, yeah, I have these ideas and I think they'll work, and I need technical people, and I want them to join, I want them to be excited about it, and I don't want to shack them into a desk, but how do you approach somebody so it doesn't seem like I don't need you to go do a job and then you need to go leave? How do you, how would you want to be, I guess, pitched, I guess, in a way? Um, that seems attractive. Uh, this is something I have to do a lot in my current role at IBM. Um, uh, the last seven years I've been leading this, this new market for IBM, right? And new market for IBM means I have to influence a lot of people, right? It's not like, you know, I joined and suddenly they give me this huge budget and they're like, hire whoever you want. And it's really a leadership through influence. So you've got to paint the vision, right? And in a way that is compelling to people so that they feel invested, so that these programmers get to pour their heart, their soul into something that ends up being a labor of love of sorts, that they feel part of it, right? They have a sense of self-direction and they can help be able to create, create something that is, um, that is of interest to them. That's the real trick of it in my perspective. I, I think just briefly, no matter what idea you bring to that great technical person you meet, the end product's gonna look nothing like you thought it would and nothing like they thought it would. So you need to come with that humility of here's my initial idea. Tech guy, you're gonna laugh at this, but that's okay. There's, an, there's something in here that's good. Get them, as you said, excited and invested and then see where it leads you at the end because it's gonna be very different, always is. Oh, it's something just quickly to that, which is in, in my situation, when I paired up with my business partner, we actually we met each other because we were sitting side by side at an event at the Carolina Union that was kind of a general interest uh, meeting for the Carolina Undergrad Entrepreneurship Club that was out of the business school, but for, for anyone across campus. And so we just started chatting. Um, but he, you know, I think probably like many technologists, I at the time had several tech projects going on. So I was running a small kind of consulting business, had a couple employees as a full-time student here. And then I had three software products that we were, that were kind of in the consulting firm. And so I was, I was just stretched then. So his pitch to me was actually more around, you know, let me focus on this part of, the, of, of what you have and turn it into a business. Um, and I simply didn't have the time to kind of argue. It wasn't like we were gonna co-found it together. I said, yeah, I've got all these other, you know, kind of irons in the fire right now. If you wanna run with that, that sounds great. If this thing starts to work, then let's figure out how to build a business around it. And we actually did. So 
for, that's uh, October of uh, 2002 through the next summer, we worked on it through just kind of a consulting arrangement where he was just getting paid on sales commission actually. And almost a year later, we said, all right, this is starting to work, it's starting to sell, we needed more uh, feature needs, I needed to step back in as a technologist and improve the product. Um, and we officially co-founded the business then where he had actually brought a bunch to the table, sales, revenue, traction, even just some kind of simple marketing stuff. And it was time for me to step back in and improve the tech product to, to make it something that he could sell to even more people. So we had some experience working together and, a little, and both had a little bit of credibility with each other before we decided to divvy up the chips. If I were you, and either technical guy pitching to business guy or business guy pitching to the technical guy, I think there are two things. One is they need equal share of the company, and it, whether it be stock or whether it be decision making or both, is that there shouldn't be classes of citizens in the company, especially a startup. It needs to be, the technical people need to feel they have input on the decisions the same as the business people do, not that they're some different class of citizen. And every way you can assure them that they are equal class of employee will help your, help your sales pitch. Um, short answer is yes, but it's not going to be 50%. By the time you get funded, neither of you will have 50%. <laughs> so the point is they should feel that they're equal to you. Maybe it's 51, 49, or whatever. But the, the fact is if you need a technical leader and they're not in the same situation in terms of ownership or decision-making input, you can still make the final decision. You could have a couple more percentage points than the, the technical person. but. At least for me, it's never worked where there's a major difference in power between the technical and the business people in the company. So I would say it has a lot to do with what your business is. So if, if you have a business that's not really technology driven and you're talking about having someone build a you know, simple mobile app or your website for you, then that's, that's you hire that out. But if you've got a technology business, um, which is interesting because you said you've built it and you have something, you're not a technologist. So I'm just, anyway, it's a different question, but that's great. Um, so maybe you are a technologist if you've somehow brought a technical product to market. Um, I, I think it just has to do with that balance. I mean, this is a software company, then, then I think all of, all, of, all of these thoughts stand true, which is that the technical leader needs to be there alongside the business leader. Um, if it's not, then maybe you just need to outsource some tech, a technology job and get it done and, and move on. Yes, Steve. Let me expand that to the situation where there's a, a major client, a dominant uh, so now, uh, and, and that dominant client is an investor. Um, they um, have a, cer a, a certain, uh, certainly they have an influence on, on, on the company, and they have a major concern about the company running well. Uh, uh, not just the technology working, but the company running well. Um, and therefore they very much want a a senior engineering leader who also has some business experience. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, what the situation should be in, in that kind of an environment? I had that. So the company Telcatar was the major funder was the Ford Motor Company. And um, I was fortunate because it was them that selected me to, the, me to be the CEO. So I had an inside. I knew the CEO of, of Ford at the time from a previous relationship. But the problem wasn't in the leadership of the company. The problem was they owned 20% of the company, but they felt like they owned 50% or 51%. <laughs> and that's the way they behaved on the board. So they felt they could veto major decisions of the company if they didn't like them. And I found that very frustrating. And it actually came to be when we went to sell the company, uh, Ford didn't agree with the terms. 
And so they, with 20% of the company, I had to arrange to make sure I had enough votes to outvote them. So it can be very difficult if, if their view of what you're doing is different than what you think is right for the company. In my, in my case, even though they didn't, they are the ones that found me to run the company, it was still quite difficult. Okay, uh, I'll start. Uh, so on the game side, grab a free engine and prototype something as fast as you can. Uh, it really depends on your status, right? I mean, if you're a student, man, what a great time to just blow off all your professors and get some work done on your, uh, your pet projects, because you're gonna drop out anyway when you're a billionaire. Um, <laughs> if you're supporting a family, then this is your spare time at night, or you've got three months with your co-founders to maybe you know, burn on savings for a little while, but I'm a big fan of do as much development as you can that's reasonable before you bring it out for funding, because you're just gonna get a better look. You're gonna get a better deal. If it's in the game space, no publisher's gonna talk to you unless you've got a pretty good proposal of a game or ideally you've got a demo or ideally you've got some first product that's out in a limited market and you're showing people your retention numbers or whatever else and it's I mean it's not unreasonable to make a hundred million dollars off a video game that took four man weeks to make because it's been done a couple times this year already right so uh, you don't need you don't need man years and tons of effort to build something to prove your point in the game space and but the engines are free. And the, engine, <laughs> the engines are all free till you start making money right now. The Unreal Engine, Unity Engine, they're both quick to learn, tons of stuff out there. So uh, I'd wait a little while before getting money if you can, right? I mean, that's when you go get money, I guess, is when you don't have a choice, right? <laughs> yeah, so I'll add to that from the, from the eye contact story specifically, there were a couple things we did really right that we had no clue that we were doing right at the time. So one of them was that we didn't go out and try and get capital. And so, you know, if you think about the environment um, 13 years ago now, um, you know, I'm 20, 21, and my co-founders 18, 19 that first year, um, people weren't necessarily giving money to guys our age in that year. Or so, um, you know, now it's a little more popular for, you know, to see a couple of young co-founders working on a business. Um, I remember our first investor at our first dinner very clearly saying, I just gave you guys a million dollars. I have a son who's older than you. I would never give him a million dollars. <laughs> so we t he took it really seriously. Um, <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the things we did really, really right was because people weren't giving money to guys like us. Uh, we didn't expect it. We didn't think it was possible. And so we bootstrapped it. I, I had the technology skill. My business partner had the marketing and sales skill. Um, so we built that business to about two and a half million in annual revenue before we talked to any outside investors and we were growing, we were essentially profitable, we were break even because we were taking every additional dollar profit we made and putting it back into marketing every month. So um, we had profit if we wanted to not grow as fast. And um, a local uh, tech startup guy by the name of Judd Bowman uh, said at the time, you know, this is the time to raise capital. <laughs> you guys are still young, but you've got almost a $3 million annual run rate business and you don't need capital, go raise capital. And he was absolutely right. Um, we, you know, if we'd raised early on, typically you give up in the seed round about 30% of your business, and the next round you might give up another 30%. You run out of 30% to give out pretty quickly after a few rounds. Um, yeah, and a couple of those you're past 50%, which means you and your founders are now in the minority in the business. And so someone, you're essentially working for a financial buyer at that point. Um, we were really, really lucky that our first million bucks that came into the business took only 3.8% of our company, and that was because of how much revenue we had. Um, the follow-on rounds still diluted us pretty minimally as well, so we owned uh, over 50% of that business almost until the very end, um, and we raised over $60 million in outside capital in total, and so a lot of the reason why we held on to so much ownership and control 
was just that we had that revenue in the beginning. And in the software world, it's really, really reasonable unless there's some specific cases. I know gaming certainly is one of those specific cases, at least from what I've seen. Um, but you know, in web apps and mobile apps, yeah. I mean, if you, as long as you have a tech talent in the business and a, and a business talent in, in the business, then there's no reason to raise that capital early. In, in fact, there's, I can go on forever about it, but there's so many reasons not to, in my opinion. There's so many downsides to, to not, to doing that. So. Interesting. Other questions? Um, speaking for IBM, we have a global entrepreneurship program, and we also have incubator funds uh, specifically for startups that want to integrate with some of the applications which we've created. So for example, we've got one um, that's specific to Watson, which you may have heard of, the artificial intelligence which we've built. So startups who are interested in utilizing the artificial intelligence to go after new markets, create new solutions, get funding through IBM's VC program. Uh, but there's actually a number that have started, um, at least uh, specific to, to IBM. I, I think there's a number of resources. I can do the vertical if you guys don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can run you through a couple if you want. I think he wants yeah. to do it. No, no. Yeah, you, you, you start, and if you miss anything, I'll, I'll fill it in. Well, no, go for it. John Austin is an alumni of the department yep. that runs Robert Glass in American Underground in Durham. Um, I think he went through maybe Bulgaria. Um, and they are a nonprofit, so they're accelerator light, but they're totally free to take the light work. You have three months, you get access to a bunch of investors to work on your pitch deck. You guys can figure out when you pitch, how to get it all together. And then you can apply for NCIDL, which is a nonprofit that will give you up to 50K to get you off the ground and do some expenses. And then there's other accelerators like Startup Factory, American Underground, there's a launch, Chapel Hill, uh, HP Rod. There's a bunch of different places that want to help. In the area, so you know, these guys are all further along in that part, but having just come through that ramp, there's a lot of resources right here. There's also a competition which just finished, the Carolina Challenge, which also is a great mechanism to get some early seed funding and then funnel you to to those incubators. Yeah, I think another thing important to think about with that is there are local resources, and then there's really no reason in this day and age not to look at all the ones nationally as well. So um, a guy named Coleman Green's been running a, a startup and kind of has got a device with software related to it. I don't know exactly what they do, but around health and wellness and uh, children in schools. And um, they started in a couple of the programs in Durham, and then they got accepted into the Techstars uh, Chicago one. So they did Techstars there, then they got accepted into one in Seattle and went and did one there. And they've now got a corporate investor, a uh, strategic investor there who's um, interested in you know, proliferating their product essentially uh, into, into their clients on the West Coast. And so now they're relocating the West Coast with that funding. Um, so you, you know, it's a very global world now and that's just US examples, but you know, across the US, the, the tech stars and the big accelerators are really everywhere and there's no reason not to, especially if you're a college student, not to apply to those if, if you're flexible on location. Sometimes they include lodging or you just stay somewhere real easy with one of their buddies for a couple months. So those are really, really powerful. I wouldn't limit yourself to here, um, especially when you're thinking about the funding side of it. I would say absolutely do not limit yourself to North Carolina because you will be depressed and probably treated poorly by some of the nice investors here who wish well but don't have the scope and ability to do things that other investors outside of this market can. So start with DC and Atlanta. If you don't find what you like there, just start thinking Boston, New York, Austin, and this market will have to catch up eventually in that category. But um, when it comes to accelerators, there is one downside I want to mention. Um, I have not personally gone through one, but I've spoken to pretty much every class at all the local ones for the last five or six years, so I've seen a lot of the businesses. One of the things I don't like about that model is that they sort of create the concept that you know, you're going to figure this thing out in large form in 12 weeks or 10 weeks or whatever it is. And my experience is that it is much more of a long-term iterative process and success, again, 15 startups, right? It comes from not dying, right? So staying alive as long as you can and pivoting until you're successful. I am not a believer that you're going to figure it out in even in, in any substantial form in a 10-week period of time. So I do like that they focus you and get you into, you know, into your business thinking about it very clearly for 10 weeks, but I don't like that afterwards they typically just kind of you know, they've taken some equity, usually a decent little chunk of equity for not much cash. They package a lot of advice, which is good, 
and then they kind of dump you out at the end of it. So they're not bad, but think about, you know, they, they give you money and advice. Think about other places where you could get either money or, and advice, or maybe you don't need money, you just need advice. And you can do that on, on much shorter terms or much longer terms, whatever you want, on your terms, really. Um, well, let me follow, follow up on that. And, you know, you guys are all successful, and we're talking a lot about success stories, but along the theme of the 15 uh, startups, I'd be curious to hear your experiences, either your direct experiences or for those that you might know of, of for the folks that maybe were less successful, this, this notion of, when do you double down, and when do you walk, bail, or as you more politely said, uh, pivot? So, <laughs> curious to take your take. All 15 were successful. Right? Yeah, they were all <laughs> huge successes. <laughs> uh, I think the, uh, you're, so you're looking for fun failure stories, or you're looking for, uh, or, 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 a lesson that I've seen failures or, or, or stem from? Out of the fire. You know? Oh, gosh, man, uh, well, I'll just say that the lesson I see is that anyone can make something good with enough time. And I think that notion of iterating quickly and what you were talking about, pivot if you find you're in the wrong business with the right product and being able to give it up and move or quit. I think quitting is probably the hardest thing for people to do because your idea is probably fine. If you gave it another three or four years and you know stopped doing anything but focusing on that, eventually you would get it. Every game will be a 100% rating if you give it enough years of time to get there. And the hard part is deciding to stop working on it and back off of it and say, this is, this is gonna take twice as long as it should, and in that time I could build three more products like it, let's try again. So knowing how to let go of something, I think is probably the most mistakes I've seen in the startup space is they just keep going, spend everything they've got, and should have tried something new. How do you let go? I'm terrible at it, are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> Does it help if you have something else to go to? In other words, like, okay, mm. this is done. So you're talking about the dating model of development. <laughs> yes, yes. It's much easier to break up if you've got a new girl that you want to go out with. Absolutely. Uh, it's, a, it's always a matter of that hard decision of do we give this one more rev or do we back off and go someplace else? And you can find a million stories of you know, Rovio's 57th game was Angry Birds, or Chillingos, I should say, and they were gonna shut down, and then they have a multi-billion dollar product. And if they had shut down when any reasonable person would have, they would have missed out on that. So, uh, yeah, and f there's great apocryphal stories on both sides of that equation. Uh, for me, it's very gut-based. Uh, when I hear my engineers justifying, they're like, oh, but you don't understand, it'll be fun, we just need more sound effects, and that will make this, and it's like, no, it'll make it a tiny bit more, but it's not gonna really fix this problem. Once they start justifying and making up reasons why it's late again and again, and it's not coming together, that's where you can start feeling it in your gut, but I, I don't think there's any good model for knowing when the right time it's over, it just comes with experience. I heard something the other day, a, a business professor said that when he invests in some of his uh, startup teams, that, um, or any time he invests, he requires them to define failure so they know when, when they've gotten there. Um, I love that. Uh, up front. And I think that's extremely hard to do as an entrepreneur, right? Because the, the facts will change and the, the context around it will change by the time you get there. That said, I wish I'd done that in, in many cases. And, and I love the concept. Define failure up front. This metric, if it hasn't exceeded this by this date, you know, the window just isn't there, or the opportunity cost for us is just too high. We could be doing something else. We could be working a job, making real money, whatever it is. Um, so that's way harder to do than to say, and I haven't done it, but I love the concept. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've said a lot of those for teams, either ones that I run or I'm companies I'm on the board of, and it's really painful, and they hit the failure point, and then start arguing about why. Yeah, they absolutely. haven't really hit it, and it doesn't count, and, but last week was, a, it was Christmas, you know, how was I, you didn't know Christmas was coming? You know, the, uh. Other questions? Can I add one to that? Sure. For, for me, this decision is, is the hardest decision you have to make as a CEO. And it's, it's proportional, the difficulty is proportional to the number of people in the company because that's the number of lives it affects. And it's the amount of money you need if you want to keep going. The more people you have, the more money you need. So it's a really tough decision if the company is fairly large to make. And so I've screwed it up at least twice. And both times it was because I read the sense of the organization wrong. So I'll just give you one example. Um, It was at Silicon Graphics when, we, when they, the people above me decided we should buy Cray for various political reasons. And 
the people working for me all wanted to to get money from the board directly to go small, that is to, to became, become what NVIDIA became. And that was the right decision, when, and I should have fought for it. But it, it was just, the, the upper man was just against it. And so I decided to say, okay, fine, we'll, we'll sh basically shut our division down. And it was, it was a mistake, because the, the people went off and did great things, and I think if we'd stayed, and fought for the money, we would have done great things for Silicon Graphics. It'd be a different company today. It'd be NVIDIA. Uh, it'd be NVIDIA today, because that's where most of those people went. Might be NVIDIA plus TiVo, because that's where the people went. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Kate. So, just you know, getting advice from the department's point of view, right? We have a curriculum to train computer scientists, right? And obviously, not everybody has not but to the extent that it mattered at all, is there any part of a computer science curriculum that you thought was particularly useful for somebody who was entrepreneurially minded? Software Engineering 145. I don't yeah. know what you call it now. Yeah. Yep. Yep. 523. 523. All right. Yeah, I learned the difference between producer and director, and I got mad because somebody else was the director, and I was like, I'm the smartest one, and I became producer, which is where I really needed to be, and I learned the separation between those roles. I can't tell you how many teams that I threw what I learned in 145, 523, right in their faces, separate these decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Just one useful thing? Yeah, yeah the, the, the group, I don't remember what the number was, the group class where we were building, uh, yeah, I don't even God, what was the context. It wasn't really kind of a commercialization class. It was more of kind of like group programming we presented in here. I'm trying to remember what was it, 119 was that something? 191? Is that okay, same thing, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, that I mean that that taught me around uh, just the, the team building um, side of it, working with other developers on a project when we all had different skill sets and just learning how hard that was. Um, of that team of four, there's three other than me, I hired two of them <laughs> into my business. Um, one worked out for a long period of time, one worked out for about two weeks. Um, but I learned so much from that. How actually building something? Like, like, let's say that same class is being offered in a business school where it's all about, you know, the management and the, you know, that kind of thing, but not actually building a product, right? Was the building of a product an important aspect of that? Crucial, but I'd say 50-50. So I think there's a lot that I've learned out in the business world around iteration and kind of lean startup and testing models that are really just scientific method in the business world. Um, but that wasn't talked about as much because it was more kind of conceive it and then figure out how to build it, which is crucial. I think the other 50% is conceive it, figure out how much you have to build to test it, understand if it was a good idea or not. And I've missed the mark on that many times in my career, actually. For me, that course was valuable because the project had a customer. We had to build something that something was going to use, and I learned so much from doing that. It, having to have it something somebody wanted, instead of something that you wanted them to have, in spite or of what. Or that a professor just kind of created uh, to create a project. For example, yes, yes. From the business school perspective, the classes that I got the most out of were the entrepreneurship classes. Launch the venture, in particular, was excellent, excellent, because um, you really form diverse teams. So not just the business school students, but also the tech students as well from the comp side department. In order to come up with an idea, meet with coaches and mentors regularly, work through the business plan, it was a wonderful learning opportunity for me. Yeah, I will say it's been a long time. I was an undergrad before there was a department for that, right? We didn't have a major, but that was the only group programming class I took here as an undergraduate, which is disappointing, I would say, uh, and because that's senior level course, right? Uh, in in graduate programs, certainly, and in, in research work, absolutely, we were always teamed up. But as an undergraduate, uh, seeing my first time programming with someone, let's say without it being called cheating, uh, my first time being in senior year, it's too late for someone to learn those skills because as a hiring manager, that's what I always look for is group project. I'm happy to have it be a class project, I don't care, but I wanna see that you know how to work with other people because I don't wanna teach you that. You should know that already. You work at Chick-fil-A or you worked, uh, uh, you took uh, group programming classes, but you need to have learned those skills before you come to work in a professional environment. I would, I would say two other sets of courses, this may seem strange, but when I was here, you had to have a language but statistics counted. So I took two courses in experimental statistics, and actually I kept all the books I took for all the courses I took here, and I write them 
when I take them out and look at them again. And the, the two books I read the most are Mythical Man Month and my experimental statistics books. Those are the two books I look at the most. And possibly it's because I was involved for a long time with manufacturing and statistical quality control was critical to that. But th those were really valuable. And the other, although it was very basic, we were just getting into 3D when I was here in graphics. The stuff I took in graphics was really valuable to me going forward. And I was able to extrapolate what I learned in 2D to 3D fairly straight. So those were really valuable courses to me. And that, again, the textbooks were marked. Sure. <laughs> Other questions? Steve. Um, <clears throat> say you're in a situation where one of the major factors of your competitive advantage, you think, is, is a technical uh, idea, methodology, what have you. Uh, this will, you know, <laughs> obviously relate to Greg Hunt. In, yep. in, the, in the startup that we had, Greg was our, uh, you know, our patent attorney. Uh, and the issue has to do with the way of protecting that, that technical idea in a small, in a small startup. The, the, difficult, the difficult decision is that getting a patent is a very expensive process for a uh, start up with a relatively, you know, say half a dozen employees uh, in, in that kind of uh, level of uh, <coughs> cost per year. And, um, and the alternative is trade secrets, right? Uh, and if you do a patent, on top of that, you have to be able to prosecute it. And first of all, you have to be able to find out that someone's abrogating it. And secondly, you have to be able to prosecute it. And all that is way past the expense of a, of a small startup. So, but on the other hand, trade secrets are weak and uncomfortable uh, because you're making people keep, keep secrets. Oh, comment on that uh, tension. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you told me you were going to ask me this, and I've been thinking about it since you told me this, and I still don't have a good answer. <laughs> I think it's really tough, and I haven't been involved in that except once, but I think it's, it's really difficult, particularly if, like I think in your case, where if the original IP comes from somebody who wants to continue to use it in research, i.e. in the quasi-public domain, yet the company wants to use it in a, in a protected domain, how do you figure out how to share? Well, that's a separate question. Oh, is that a separate question? Okay. But that's... that's that's a tough question. The, the trade secret versus patent is, in my, my view, is you should, if you have a really good idea and it's part of your competitive advantage, you should try very hard to patent it, in spite of the expense. Yeah, I think if it's crucial to your business, I think it's worth at least trying and going down the front side of it. Um, in my businesses, it just hasn't been crucial. Um, and the one time where, the, the time where it frequently comes up and almost only there is when talking to investors because they just want to know how much of your IP do you own? Do you clearly own your IP? And then what protections are on it? And we found that as long as we prove that we clearly own it and we have good agreements with our employees that they didn't bring anything in and that we own our IP, that in our space, they're fine with it. Um, the side of protecting uh, against other people doing it um, as, it, as I think Mike mentioned it, there was, there was no real high science in the eye contact business. Um, and so it makes us a little bit different. Thanks. Appreciate that. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, not a lot. Um, you know, the, there were certainly some complexities to scaling some parts of our business. So we were in the email business. Um, and, you know, before I, before I mention any numbers around our business, I always like to mention that we were sending good email for good people to good recipients. So we're not in the other side of this business. Um, and compliance and feedback loops from the ISPs and end users was a huge part of our business. So if people didn't like getting the emails, our users were getting shut off. But in order to scale from um, you know, sending a, a thousand emails is basically the same as sending one. You just send one a thousand times. Sending a hundred thousand was a completely different and, and complex problem. Um, you know, and sending uh, 10 million and then sending 100 million a day as we were in our later years was a completely differently uh, sized problem. And what we found is that 
we named that technology. I can't even remember what we named it now, to be honest. It was in our investment presentation, and we put a little trademark symbol on the end, and investors loved it. We had no IP protection behind it, no patent. <laughs> it, was the, it was like the, the urchin system or something. It wasn't that. I forget what it was, and they just thought that was so cool. Um, so we made it come to life with a name. That was all we needed. <laughs> Do you have any interesting tips or anecdotes or things about how to get how you get hold of your customers? What sort of feedback they give you? Go, go ahead. Usertesting.com. I use it all the time. <laughs> Recruit users. They test it live. You get a video of it. I post it at 11 p.m. at you know midnight. It's back in my inbox. I watch a user go through our app. We iterate. There's something new out the next day. There's a lot of technology like that, but just using the internet to do it and automate it. And as a nerd, it saves me having to talk to a human being, which sometimes is nice. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot easier now in the internet era. It, it's changed dramatically because of the internet. But the things that have changed is your customers can find you, which is, didn't used to happen before. Well, just, just, if I can add a point of clarification, is it different for you with, when you're doing um, mass market versus, say, business to business? I mean, you've got to have some notion of a driving customer in mind. So often in games, it's ourselves, or it's what we think girls who like Barbie will want in your Barbie mobile app, um, you know, but it's some notion, some uh, representational customer. I think that's fine for the, you know, people call it the MVP. I call it an optimal first release. I think that's a far better term than minimal viable product. But, you know, some initial product release, I think that's fine to prove concept. And like you said, it's so easy to get 100 people to bang on an app for an hour and see what, what they think of it. But I, I really like having either a, I've done games where we put together, this is the name of our customer. His name is Tom. He's 17 years old. He likes these movies and he doesn't like these movies. He likes these games, and not these games. We designed for him representationally, but some way of saying that's in, that's out because the customer doesn't like it. Uh, if you're building for IBM, I guess you can just ask them. But if you're not working with one customer, and apparently it's a bad idea to have one big customer who has a part of your company because it makes <laughs> your life very difficult later. Um, we'd use representational customers. And I think that's fine for early first couple of months, get something together. This will make representational Tom happy. And that's enough to show people and try out. One thing that I learned at Keenan Flagler when getting the MBA was um, through this whole launch the venture process where we were uh, being asked to in, to talk to not only customers but also competitors, right, to do a, a competitive analysis. If you go and you tell them, I'm a student, you would be amazed what kind of information <laughs> They will tell you on both sides. Seriously, it's like a secret superpower. You should totally use this, you know, if you're a student, definitely. <laughs> well, let me ask a question and take it in a slightly uh, different direction as we wind up here. Um, is it inherent in doing a startup that it's an all or nothing proposition? Can you do it on 40 hours a week? I can. I liken starting a business to having a colicky baby. <laughs> like you have to ask yourself, am I ready to have a colicky baby? I mean, that's, that's a newborn, you know? And it's, it, it takes a lot. It's a lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of effort. And it's not just you, it's your family, your friends. It's an investment from everybody. When I left my previous company, everybody asked if I was going to start a new company, and I said not until I can lead it from the front with passion. And that takes a lot of time. It doesn't necessarily have to be 80 hours a week, but you've got to you've got to bring more passion than everybody else to get them along on the ride with you, and that's very difficult. I mean, if there's anything I've learned from running companies and growing up, I suppose, it's manage my energy, not my time. Uh, time is easy to find, but you know, you can't get anything done from two to three if you're sleepy and you haven't had any, you had a big lunch and all those sorts of things. So manage, when are you productive? Take those hours when your energy is and apply that to your company. But I think you're kidding yourselves if you, if you think you can jump into a company, really run with it. Please tell me you've run some in 30 hours a week and that it's possible. But to me, I think you've got you've to show a passion for it to get everyone behind you and excited, and that's going to take more than nine to five. 
yeah, all of those were failures. So it's a, <laughs> it can be done. Yeah, yeah, I nailed it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, yeah, in good weeks, sure. Um, but I think, you know, you know, this is one thing I've found in in founding a couple of companies, and, and even if. Even so, in the eye contact business, all of our employees were shareholders. Anyone that had been there six months was a shareholder in the business. And when we sold our business, no one made less than uh, the smallest uh, cut was eight grand to literally a customer service, hourly customer service rep getting paid, you know, 16 bucks an hour that showed up, you know, the day before. We actually accelerated that at sale to anyone who was literally on the payroll that day. Um, but despite that, and, and some of our, you know, early hires and other executives made millions and millions of dollars. Um, despite that, no one is as passionate about the ideas as the founders are going to be. And often that translates into that no one is going to go as far as, as you're going to go. And um, sometimes that makes, you, makes me feel bad as a founder. Like, I'm the only one that cares to this level. Sometimes I think they're probably more sane than I am to care to a certain level. Um, so it's a, it's a balance, but there's, you know, there's no one to go in and put out the fires, especially in the early weeks, months, years, um, other than the founders. No one will care as deeply. Um, I've just done some absolutely fantastically ridiculous things in order to keep my companies alive and to help customers and um, that, that are completely unreasonable, and I don't think a lot of other people that aren't founders of, of businesses would do that. So that's just, it's just a reality. I think the passion thing is a big part of it, and if you can communicate your passion to your employees and the team that you've built, then it helps a lot to be able to communicate that passion to other people that pay when you're running a startup. It's family, it's friends, you know. It does, you know, it's not as bad as it sounds. You don't lose all your friends when you run a startup, but there's certainly costs. Um, I mean, as a college student, I can think of many, many times when I'd finished up homework and all my friends were going out to the bars and I didn't go um, because I was jumping on client work for my consulting business in, in my dorm room. Um, don't tell the university that. Um, I think maybe these days that's maybe a little more allowed. Back then it was, it was not necessarily allowed to use the uh, internet in the dorm for commercial purposes. Um, and, and I was working on trying to commit code to move the startup to the next level and other people weren't. And, uh, I know, I look back on that, I, I enjoy that difference, and, and that still drives me now today, this day, that um, even after having a good exit, um, I'm still, you know, the last person in the proverbial virtual office now. We don't work out of a physical space currently, but um, I try and outwork everybody, because that's, that's, that's what I need to support my passion, is to be one of the hardest workers there. Well, that brings us to, to a close here. Let's thank our, our panelists. Thank you very much.